All right, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, need to get started for the interest of time and just so we stay on track here. They actually cut our time by a little bit. So, um, yeah, I think lunch is now starting at 11.50. So I'm what's holding you from lunch. So I'll uh, do my best to keep your entertainment through the talk. I'm Stephen Piers. I'm the sustainability manager at Cotton Incorporated. Today we're going to talk about the Cotton Trust Protocol and I'll try to build my case for why I think this will help kind of make the supply chain more resilient overall. Um, so we're going to kind of talk about the pressures of sustainability from the consumer lens, from the brand and retailer side, touch on our progress that we've made over the years, and then kind of go into the justification for the protocol, at which point I'll pass it off to Nathan Reed and um, we'll you know, he'll give his perspectives on it and sustainability in general. So here's a study from Cotton Incorporated, our um, global environment survey, just kind of looking at consumer attitudes towards environmental awareness and that sort of thing. And what we see is kind of across the board increasing environmental awareness. But when you really dig into some of this stuff, um, transparency when you're considering um, what makes a company responsible um, transparency is very big in that, so 75% of consumers answered that. Um, for clothing brands, so specifically for apparel, um, transparency equals trustworthiness. So that's about 80% of respondents said that the more transparent brands are, um, the more trustworthy they think these brands are. And then Generation Z, that's kind of 1996 and beyond, I believe, but kind of this next generation they feel very strongly about environmental issues and they say that over 50% of them will say this will increase or impact their purchasing decisions. So this next phase of Gen Z kind of digging more into that, we did some research as well on them and had them rank their top environmental issues and you see climate change topping that list. So they had to rank what their top three issues were and climate change was at the very top of that list. You see of course the other environmental, social, and political issues too. So climate change is a big deal to this new consumer segment that is growing in purchasing power every year. You see this, this is Raleigh, North Carolina, climate marks, so they're kind of out there. In fact, you can see some of the younger generation there, probably Generation Z, and you know, holding signs like this one, there's no planet B. So you have kind of this leader, I'm sure, you know, like her or not, we have Greta Thunberg's very influential voice with this Gen V. She's kind of the leader of the Gen Z um, movement, if you will. And this was a couple weeks ago. She had 9.7 million followers in the March in Milan. She posted this and within two hours had over a million likes. So obviously there's a lot of support for this movement in the younger generation. So that kind of trickles down. Brands get pressure. Not that I agree with <clears throat> this sort of um, ranking of brands and retailers, but this sort of thing is out there. This is the filthy fashion scorecard. You see the rank here from less sustainable down here up to more sustainable. And basically what this is looking at is companies' commitments, what they're putting out there, their public facing goals in terms of reducing their emissions. And like I said, don't necessarily want to be on the bottom of this list, so <clears throat> there's a lot of effort put into coming up with these goals and being transparent with that. So, you know, there's also these initiatives out there. When these companies make these goals, they're public. So there's standards, global reporting initiative, just one of many um, kind of standards out there for these companies to report their emissions, track their progress. When they make these commitments, this is a way that they communicate with their investors and stakeholders <clears throat> if they're making progress. and this is a huge thing. It basically drives this conversation here. So 93% of the world's largest 250 corporations report their sustainability performance through some initiative similar to GRI. <clears throat> well, what does that mean for cotton? We obviously have done better over the past 35 years, and this is due to a lot of different factors, whether it be <clears throat> better varieties in seed, um, technology, cotton pickers, you know, we went from a tractor to cotton pickers, research from university, from Cotton Incorporated, kind of everyone just doing 
their part to be better. We see dramatic improvements across the board, um, but unfortunately, it's not enough for brands and retailers. So <clears throat> in 2017, we adopted the 10-year sustainability goals for the U.S. cotton industry, and that was based off 2015 data from USDA. And you know, you see the goals here, anywhere from increasing soil carbon, so that's soil health related, anything we can do to put carbon back in the soil, all the way to greenhouse gas emission of decreasing that by 39%. <clears throat> and we'll drill into that one a little bit with my focus earlier on the climate uh, emphasis and that new generations kind of being more focused on that. So here's kind of what we did to come up with that goal. It is a uh, yield-based metric, but we took trend through time using USDA data and then tried to be aggressive with this, and um, that is our goal. That's the 39% reduction there, and that's in line with the Paris Climate Accord, which we'll get into a little more, but, you know, a lot of companies are kind of hitching on to that and um, trying to do better as well, so this is kind of us doing our part in that process. So. <clears throat> If you kind of look at this thing, so any company, this is kind of a schematic of their supply chain, how they report emissions through things like the GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative, is based on a scope one, two, and three emissions. So direct emissions, that would be if you're burning natural gas at your facility, so direct emissions, and then kind of more indirect ones with your purchased electricity, and then scope three which is business travel and um, if you're an apparel company that would be cotton so we are part of their scope three when they're making these goals and commitments we are part of that so anything we can do to help them get towards their goals is positive and kind of a selling point to use this fiber <clears throat> talking about science-based targets and this 1.5 degrees so that's kind of this number comes from the paris climate accord so the science, global climate change scientists got together and they came up with this number. So as long as we limit global emissions to only increasing temperatures by 1.5 degrees C or less, we should be good. So there's things like the science-based target initiatives that is also another initiative for companies to sign up to and pledge to reduce their emissions to kind of help meet this goal. Here's kind of what it looked like. So I used this slide maybe this time last year, and there was only 389 companies taking action. I was going to update for this presentation, and I thought, okay, I'll leave that for now, because now we have 778 companies. So this is in one year, it's more than doubled. You see it's kind of spread across the world. Um, companies based out of US, of course Europe, and then kind of all over. So that leads us to the next point kind of digging down even more, companies are making targets for sourcing sustainable cotton. You see the headline here, this is from June 2019, Gap Incorporated announced 100% sustainable cotton goal by, 20, uh, and I think their goal is by 2025, yes, that's what it is. So kind of just some major brands that I'm putting up here that have these different goals. Of course, you have companies like Patagonia and Piranha there. Sourcing goals are based off, you know, using organic cotton. If that works for you, that's fine. Um, but more companies are saying this 100% sustainable. What exactly does that mean? That varies by company and by, um, you know, what they focus on. But mostly it's, you know, some mix of organic BCI or um, what they're defining as sustainable. Actually, Walmart defines that as just U.S. cotton now, which we would agree that would be fine, um, but kind of digging into that and the justification for the trust protocol before we came up with that program, which I'm going to talk a little more about, the U.S. didn't have a way to kind of enter this market. And um, I meant to mention here, I had our Global Insights team from Cotton Incorporated, I gave them the list. So this is just kind of some of the list. There's 35, 36 brands, probably more than that now, that have made these targets for 100% sustainable cotton by between now and 2025. So not including home textiles, I said, give me a really conservative number what that looks like for a bale demand. And I said somewhere between three and a half million bales, maybe five million bales, somewhere in there, three and a half million bales of cotton, that's between now and 2025. That doesn't even include people like Ikea and their home textile market. So again, that's a lot of cotton at stake, um, what the crop and 
last year was 18, 19 million bales, so a substantial amount. Hence the need for the protocol. So I'm going to kind of dig in on what this is now. So it's uh, kind of four pillars here. I like to talk about it. So you have an enrollment phase. You make a farm profile, say where you're growing cotton. Um, there is a sustainable farm practice checklist that includes things like are you using cover crops, you're following product labels, it's things you're probably already doing and then maybe some that, well, maybe I should consider doing that into the future. Then there's this field print calculator component that's kind of digging into the data. So we have a lot of data management software tools and other um, kind of products out there that help us in the U.S. We have a lot of data surrounding our cotton growing operations. So. Uh, some of these organizations and brands really want more information on that. Again, back to my second slide, transparency equals responsibility and trustworthiness. So this is kind of giving more transparency there. So you enter things like soil type, fertilizer use, water use, what your yield is. Um, it pulls data from NRCS to get the soil type and that sort of thing. And then there's some component of independent verification as well because again, that provides more transparency to this process to uh, downstream supply chain partners. And ultimately what this does, so kind of zoom back a little bit, so there's the protocol. That's gonna help our industry meet our 10-year sustainability goals. So it's kind of driving that, starting the conversation. Are you doing these best management practices? Ultimately what that's gonna to lead to is an increased trust lower brand risk, and then reduce environmental impacts overall, and that's going to help these companies meet their goals. So this is going to kind of be a selling point for this program going forward. Um, and kind of digging into what the enroll, or sorry, the checklist looks like, it's about a hundred questions. You see different categories here, soil health, crop protection, there's worker protection. Um, like I said, this is pretty basic questionnaire, but it has some very key components to these sustainable growing practices that probably a lot of you are already doing. Um, <clears throat> options are, I do this now in my operation, I am implementing on one or more of my fields, I will consider it, or if it's not appropriate, you can check that box and then you can uh, basically explain. You'll have a <coughs> place where you can go in and say why you think it's not appropriate. So to dig into the soil health one a little bit, here's kind of what the dashboard would look like for when you enroll. So if you're going through the soil health bar, it's very user-friendly interface. You have this status bar to kind of show you how far along the process you are, and then you see here those options. So you'd say, um, for this one, I zoom in a little bit because I know you can't read that. So a couple examples, utilize conservation tillage practices such as minimum strip, mulch, or no-till. So then you would answer, you know, I'm doing it now. Um, most of my fields or maybe you'll consider doing that probably most of us are doing that and then prevent or alleviate soil compaction through prescribed tillage operations controlled traffic patterns and avoidance of traffic where soil moisture is above field capacity so those are just kind of some examples that fall under this soil health category and you kind of go through the list here and once you finish the questionnaire you um, have some more steps to go through but yeah you get to the next stage, which is use of field print calculator or some sort of data tool. So, you know, are you using field print calculator? That's, they're the Alliance for Sustainable Agriculture. They kind of came up with this metric I'll talk about in a second to enter your field level data and then it gives you basically a life cycle impact assessment of your farm. Or you can say you're using one of these other data management tools like LandDB, Agribol, or MyFarms. Or maybe one that's not on the list you could put down in here, um, like Ag Gateway or something like that. So to dig in on what the field to market is, because that's kind of um, this non-government organization, or sorry, they're a nonprofit organization that came up with this. We are a member. It's a multi-stakeholder initiative. We have grower representation as well as civil society representation from this organization. So it's a very well-respected entity. But what it is, is a system for enter the, your information. So again, from you know, your farm location, soil type is pulled in automatically whenever you put your farm boundary in. So you would basically put your address in and it would zoom in and you draw a box around if this is your field and it would automatically pull some information in and then you'd enter some general information about your operation, um, rotations, uh, 
seeding rates, that sort of thing. And then the ultimate output would be this spider gram that kind of shows where you fall on a, these six key metrics. So from land use to uh, soil conservation to energy use and then greenhouse gas emissions, it shows where you are in relation to a global and, or sorry, a state and national average. So this is a component of the protocol. And again, kind of just to talk a little bit more about why we're doing this. So every section of the protocol questionnaire is translating to a goal more or less. And you know, you could argue that some of these fall in different categories, but just as a quick look here, you know, soil health is checking the box on almost every one of these nutrient management. So as we kind of go through this process and think about it more, we are really doing a lot for our industry to help us get towards our sustainability goals. And um, that is key. So this is kind of what we're saying, why we should join. I mean, this market access piece is huge, I believe. Um, we saw a very conservative estimate, three and a half million bales, probably more than that if you include home textiles. So we need to tap into that. Showing the pride of being a cotton grower. So you're already among, you know, we pr produce the most highest quality cotton and do it in the most highly regulated and responsible manner in the world, I would argue. So just showing our pride in growing such a beautiful crop, that's another kind of key component. Long-term profitability. So again, that's tapping into this um, market of demand sustain for sustainable cotton. So that's gonna help us kind of play in that game. Owning the narrative, of course. I think, you know, a lot of these NGOs, you saw the filthy fashion scorecard. There's a bunch of bad misinformation out there for cotton growing too. So this is an opportunity for us to say, no, that stuff is not right. It does not take 20,000 liters of water to, you know, produce a t-shirt, that sort of thing. So this really has us in the game there, owning the narrative, and again, I can't stress this enough, so we just can't afford to lose market access because of a perceived, I put that in italics, perceived lack of sustainability. It's not that we aren't being sustainable, <clears throat> it's just that we have, maybe have this perceived lack of sustainability, so. Um, okay, so again, why are we doing this? Okay, here's the graph. Uh, someone was showing a graph for soybean production earlier, and I thought, hey, that looks like my graph. Um, so this is through time, fiber demand at the mill. You see this, this is polyester here at the bottom. So, <clears throat> I mean, they're taking a beating from this climate movement. It's a non-renewable fiber. We have other problems with it too. Uh, Coley Bailey talked about earlier, the microplastic thing. So we have sustainability goals. We have this program. We have a growing awareness of microplastics. I think with this program too, we really have an opportunity to recapture some of that market share. So this is just one more way to do that. <clears throat> and um, I am really excited about how that could turn out for us and we will see. Um, and I do have a video, but there's not audio. I don't know if it's gonna be, let's just see if it's gonna be, um, yeah, we're not gonna be able to hear it. I just gotta switch over to that. Uh, we can show the video at a later date. We'll tweet out some uh, links to it, I'm sure, and you can look at it. It's very nice. So for more information, the executive director is spying on me in the room. He's back there. <laughs> Ken Burton. Um, he's been at the booth as well. So of course, if you have any very long questions, I can answer any questions as well. But um, Ken Burton's also here to support. And um, with that, I'll pass it off to Nathan Reed. Here's um, some more kind of promotional materials that will be going out for this program. And we have uh, some of these in the back, too.